That's good, amen. Well, that's the only way I know how to do it. And I'll just tell you this real quick. I first did a crusade. My first crusade was in uh, Peru. And the man who mentored me in crusade, I was 19 years old. And uh, first night of the crusade I'd ever been part of. Uh, I was just blown away to see what God did. And then that next morning, he asked me to have breakfast with him and go said, you're preaching tonight. And he put me up. So I figured I would just do the same thing to Mike. Amen. <laughs> so it works well that way. Well, God's good. Amen. Amen. It is an honor to be with you guys this morning. It is an absolute honor to be with Pastor Mike and Chris and Todd and Grace and all the staff here. And, and you know, so often you hear people say that and it's cliche. Uh, but over 22 years of full-time ministry, I've tried to, as much as possible, do things with those that I have relationship with. And uh, there is not too many people out there that can even compare to the relationship that I have with Pastor Mike and Chris. And you guys are very blessed to have them as pastors. Amen. Amen. So. And so we've done a lot of things together besides India over the years. We've preached together. He's interpreted for me in Mexico. Uh, well, I don't know if he interpreted for me. I think he had, he had his own message, but it worked out still. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm, it worked out. We had miracles. So that's all I cared about. But anyways, uh, and before we get started real quick, I'm going to have my beautiful wife, Jennifer, stand up and wave to everyone. Uh, so, you know, we're... She endures me and goes everywhere with me, but uh, she just started. We got married on July 21st. So anyways, yes, I did all right, didn't I? I sure did. Oh, I know. Trust me. I trust me. God's good. God is blessing me, man. Mm, favor. But um, anyways, uh, I, I got this and believe I got a word during the, the worship. So I'm going to go with this real quick. Is there somebody here, and, and Jennifer, I'm going to pray for my wife too. I feel like I need to. But is there somebody here that there's like, a, a, the only way I can, the, the simplified way to put it is I believe it's a detached retina in one of your eyes or partially detached or you're concerned about that. Who is that this morning? Is anybody here like that? All right. Thank you. Will you stand up? I'm going to pray for you. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm going to pray for anybody else. The other thing, too, is there's someone who's having, it's like tendonitis in the ear. There's actually a name for it, but I forgot what it is. But it's like clicking in the ear. Is there anybody here like that? that they're just, it's, it's, it's very, almost the point you can feel a pulse in your ear. Who is that? Anybody else here? No. Now, oftentimes people will say after a service, that was me and I didn't come up. But uh, there is something to obedience to the Spirit of God uh, receiving. So if God's moving that area, then go, go ahead and come up. But um, um, brother, do you mind coming up here? I'm just going to pray, pray for you real quick. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. What's going on with your eye? The chest right now? Five years, sorry. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, we just thank you for wholeness right now. And we speak to this eye. And we command it to be reattached immediately in Jesus' name for full vision, clearness, Father. We thank you that any, any uh, uh, Father, just any holes in his vision, any gaps in his vision, right now that you're restoring it in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Which eye was it? Which eye was you having a problem with? Okay, close the, close the, the good side. How much vision do you have at, the, at that side, typically? None? Okay, close it. All right, not both eyes. You can't see it when you got both eyes closed, for sure. All right. Yeah. If you can see that, that's really a miracle, man. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. All right. So which one was the one that's the issue? Okay. So close the other one. All right. Can you see anything out of that yet? Shadows. Shadows. Is that the way it normally always is? No, they come through kind of like a cloud. Okay. But it's the same as, as normal right now. Right. Okay. Father, right now, we just speak to this eye. And we command it to open in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's try it one more time. Okay. Anything? Mm, same thing. Okay. Go. You got your Bible here today, right? Throughout the service, or just keep looking out of that eye and test it out, okay? I'm going to check with you again. Jennifer, stand up. Yeah. Everyone stretch forth your hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, I speak to her eye and the condition, and I thank you for complete restoration in Jesus' name. We command the hole to close. We command, Father... We command, Father, the deformity that she was born with to be made whole in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, let's just thank him for it. He's going to do it. He's done it. Amen. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to uh, Mark chapter 9. And you're going to have to give our sound people 
a break this morning because I sent them the scriptures for this service and I'm changing them on them. I apologize. Sometimes you get downloads during service and you got to go with it during worship. Amen. Mark chapter 9. So, this, so last night and this morning, uh, I've been focusing on a, on a message that I've titled, How to Heal the Sick. How to Heal the Sick. How many of you want to be confident to minister to the sick? Amen. That should be every hand in here. How many of you want to be confident that when you lay hands on people, you get results? Amen. Well, that's the way it's supposed to be. Everybody say this with me. Miracles in healing is easy. Now, I'll be the first one to say, I've got plenty of stories of areas that I failed and that things didn't work. But one thing I've learned, it's never on the God side that it didn't work. And I only say that to you this morning because when you begin to step out into these things and you begin to take risk and get bold, I don't want you thinking you're never going to fail. We have a tendency to always talk about every victory as preachers. And in doing so, we make people feel like the preacher or the specially anointed man of God or the evangelist never has a failure. I tell the people over the years who I've mentored and taught, you're going to know where, what you're made of when it doesn't work. I had one young lady who came out of my ministry. She's doing a great work. She went down to, to uh, uh, the Amazon, single lady, was doing crusades in places where some places they'd never seen a, 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 anyone outside their tribe, planting churches. Now she's living in Iraq, ministering there. But some time ago, a church that was her home church, uh, the pastor called me up one morning. And he said, he named this person. He said, I need you to give her a call because I know she listens to you. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, last night she ministered to the sick of my church. And while she was there, she was ministering and everything was going fine. And she came up on one man and he was in a wheelchair. And she didn't just pray for him. She pulled him out of the wheelchair. I said, okay, well, what happened? He said, he fell down. <laughs> so the ushers put him back in the wheelchair. What did she do? She yanks him back out of the wheelchair again. I said, well, what happened that time? He said, he fell back down. I said, okay. And he goes, Brian, she did it a third time. So he said, I need you to call her and have a talk with her and correct her. So I gave her a call up. I won't say her name or the pastor. And I said, hey, your pastor called me. He told me about the situation with the woman in the wheelchair and that she fell down or he fell down three times. She goes, yeah. He goes, well, he wanted me to correct you. So I'm calling to correct you. She goes, okay. I go, how come you didn't try four times? <laughs> how you guys know that when you're going to be bold, sometimes it's, you're going to make mistakes. You can't ever figure out how to do it and how to be led without the mistakes. Are you with me this morning? So say this with me. Healing is easy. And I want to talk, continue talking. So just so you know, every message I preached last night in this first service was not the same message. This will not be the same message. They're all building blocks. So you can go back and they were recorded and get them if you've not been here. But we've been talking about a lot of stuff on sonship and God making us equal with Jesus. But I want to switch gears a little bit this morning on the second service. And we're still talking about sonship, but I want to talk about authority through sonship and specifically who has the authority. Because when it comes to spiritual entities, meaning God, angels, devils, Satan... There's one question they're always asking. Who has the authority and who will release it that we can then be able to move? Satan can't just do what he wants to do in your life and neither can God. Are you with me? If God was just to do what he wanted to do, then this whole thing would look a lot better than what it looks like. Amen. The will of God's proven to us in, 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 in the beginning. Jesus told us clearly his will when he prayed in prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. We know that's the will of God. So why are we not seeing things happen? Because the church and the word church in Matthew 16, which eventually we'll get to here, where Jesus said he will build his church on this rock, on this revelation of what we're going to talk about. One of the things 
The word church is the Greek word ekklesia. Everybody say ekklesia. It is God's governing body in the earth. And God's governing body is not governing the earth the way God has intended us to do so. Are you with me? And the reason is, is because one, what I've been talking about the last two services, we're clueless of sonship. Don't have time to go back in it to this morning. But two, we don't understand authority and how it works. So in Mark chapter 9, let's look at a situation here where you involve a lot of different moving parts and how Jesus operated to fix a situation. Mark, Mark chapter 9, we're going to start all the way in verse 2. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth could whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Peter's Captain Obvious. You think, Peter? It is good to be here. Then Peter says this, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. We all got that friend, don't we? We've all got that friend when he does, when something goes on, they just start talking and you're thinking, shut up. Trust me. I remember these days in my teenage years when we got pulled over by cops. I had that one friend in the car that always got us in trouble because he didn't know how to shut up. <laughs> Let's just say the first meeting I ever preached, church meeting in the States at 19 years old, they had 15 people on Sunday morning service. I preached Sunday night. We had over 250 because everybody was going, there ain't no way he's preaching. They all showed up. They were waiting to watch the storm. So Peter's this guy. He gets afraid, so what does he do? He starts talking. Oh, Christians do it all the time. We get afraid, and what do we do? We don't take authority over things. We go into emergency tongues. You know what emergency tongues is, right? I'm so scared, I don't know what to do. I'll just go jump right into it, man. Sometimes you need to be quiet. We're going to see this and get be led. Amen. So he says this, let's make three tabernacles. We're going to make one for Moses. Well, that sounds good. We're going to make one for Elijah. That sounds good. And we'll make one for you, Jesus. But God doesn't seem to like this idea. And let me tell you something. Most of the church today is still living with the same mindset that Peter has here. We're going to make three tabernacles. Well, what does that look like? What, does that, what do I mean by that? See, Jesus uttered these words on the cross. It is finished. He didn't utter on the words, it's time to start over. This is a new beginning. We're adding this to everything we're doing. There was a fulfillment of something, the fulfillment of the old covenant to step into a new covenant built on better promises. Amen. So Moses, I mean, Peter here, what he's saying is this. He says, hey, you know what we need to do? Let's make a tabernacle and let's honor the legalistic law system by honoring Moses. Then he says, let's make another tabernacle and we're going to honor Elijah. Well, who does Elijah represent? He represents the prophets. I'm not talking about the prophetic gift and operating in the prophetic in, in, in this new covenant. But he represented the time of the prophets of the old covenant. And then let's make one for Jesus. Well, what's Jesus? Jesus is the fulfillment of both. He's the new covenant. See, most Christians don't operate in authority because they have a hybrid mentality with God. In other words, in one way, they say, yes, I am a new creation in Christ. I am the righteousness of God. I have all these things. And on the other hand, they're all in on the new covenant and what it represents and who they are. And then simultaneously, they're still trying to operate under the law and performance and works and operate under old covenant system. And all it creates is confusion and they're left doing nothing. 
I believe this is the reason why Revelation says, I would rather you be hot or cold, but don't be lukewarm. Hot to me represents the new covenant. Cold repeats the old covenant. Both of those will point you to Jesus. You'll either be on the law and he'll break you down till you give up and come to Christ, or you'll be hot and already understand it and walking it out. But to be lukewarm and be a little bit of both makes neither one work. So he says here, verse 7, And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Did you hear that? Yeah. And as soon as the Father says this audibly through this cloud, this glory, suddenly when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore but only Jesus with himself. I think this is very clear what God is saying to us. No, no, this isn't about the old covenant. This is about Jesus now. And everything we do operates from this place. Now, we certainly glean from and we learn, and the old covenant is an example to us. But it's not the covenant we operate anymore in. Amen? Now, as they came down from the mountain, he commanded that they should not tell, they should tell no one the things they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead meant. Now, let's jump all the way down to verse 12. No, actually, let's jump down to uh, verse, uh, um, let's jump down to verse 14. So he's coming off the Mount of Transfiguration. And I want you to see something here. There was one other time that one other person came off a mountain, and it says the glory of God was shining upon him. Anybody remember who that was? Moses, he came off of Mount Sinai, Sinai, I can't even say the word. And it says the glory shone upon him. Now we see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. This glory is not shining off of him. It's not a reflection. It is shining through him. What is that a picture of? It's a picture of the new covenant that God changes us from the inside out. Are you listening to me? It's no longer about flesh modification and trying to be good enough. It's now about the fact that Jesus has changed us through the new creation and we're transformed by understanding this. It's called identity. And when Moses came off of Mount Sinai, it says that people could not look upon him. And actually, if you go back and read that, over the next few days, 3,000 people died. Why? Because the glory of the old covenant, it kills. The law kills, but the spirit gives life. On the day that Peter got up and preached the gospel in the book of Acts, during the day of Pentecost and the Spirit of God was given, what happened? 3,000 people lived. They came to Christ. One kills, one, just, one kills, one lives. I'm setting this to you guys up for this because you've got to see this. Your authority is totally dependent on the grace of God. Nothing else. So they couldn't look at Moses, but we see here in Mark chapter 9, verse 14. Let's look at this. Jesus is now coming down. The glory of God is shining through him. It says this. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around him and the scribes disputing with them. Everybody say disputing. I just want this to be clear. Who is having a conversation here? It's the scribes. Now, if you know your Bible, the scribes were not always the greatest fans of Jesus or the disciples. They were part of the religious group. They're disputing. Do you know what disputing means? Get on Facebook and let people talk about politics. You'll see a lot of disputing. They're not in a good conversation. They are challenging. They're disputing. And immediately when they saw him, talking about Jesus, the people were greatly amazed and came running to him, greeted him. I want you to see something here. Moses came off the mount. The glory is on him. The people couldn't look upon him. They had to cover his face. Now, I don't have time to go here this morning. But do you know that one of the Greek and Hebrew words for glory means God's view and opinion? The reason why in the old covenant, when Moses came down with an old covenant glory with the law on his hand, the reason why people couldn't look into him is because they saw God's view and opinion. And that view and opinion was you're guilty. When Jesus came off the Mount Transfiguration with the new covenant glory, God's view and opinion was, you're accepted and loved. And people did what? They ran to him. Are you with me this morning? Oh, come on. This is good. 
This is why we got to quit preaching sin to the world. You ain't got to preach sin to the world. The world already know they sin it. You got to preach the gospel. We correct sin in the church. The problem with most Christians is they're trying to correct church among sinners. Or they're trying, to, they're trying to correct sin among sinners. How do you correct sin among a sinner? The only thing they know to do is a sin. They got no other identity. You correct sin in the church by pointing people to their identity, not by shaming them and condemning them. To the world, you don't try to correct sin. You preach Jesus and him crucified. Are you with me? And he changes them when they come to him. And then now the Holy Spirit can convict them into righteousness. Are you with me? We got this thing so messed up. If I, got one, if I hear one more person go, well, if we want God to change America, we need to put the Ten Commandments back in the school. What good would that do? We need to put the cross back in the school. Are you with me this morning? So we see this. They see Jesus transfigure and they run to him. They're running to Jesus because they're seeing God's unconditional love. Listen, Romans says it very clear. Romans 2 says that what? It is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's his goodness. The gospel itself literally means too good to be true news. I mean, come on. It doesn't just mean good news. The actual Greek definition, actually, the word gospel at that time was like almost a made up word that they had to come up with. You know, you ever feel like, how many of you guys are parents? And you know how you love your kids? You love them with a kind of love that is just a different kind of love, right? And when you try to tell your kids how much you love them, you ever feel inadequate because you can't find the right words to express how you feel? That's what the word gospel is. It was like God saying, I can't even express how good I am to you. I can't find the words to communicate this. It's too good to be true news. And so we see here. They run to him because of the goodness they're seeing in him. And Jesus looks at the situation here and he says this in verse 16. And he, say, and he asked the scribes, what are you, what are you, what are you discussing with them? We see here that, that uh, Mark says that they were disputing, but Jesus always being elegant in the way he handled things until he got mad and made a whip and ran him out. But, you know, he had both moments. But he, he says, what, what, are you guys, what are you guys talking about? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth and ashes his teeth. He becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of Brian theology. What that means is, is I can't prove it, but I just believe it. And I think it fits in context. I don't call it doctrine because doctrine can't just be based off what you think. But I believe wholeheartedly that this father was either one of the scribes, was rubbing elbows with the scribes, and at least was influenced by the scribes. I don't think that's so hard-fetched to believe, is it? The people you're around influence you. And he says, I brought my son, and he begins to talk about these terrible things that happened to him. And he uses the terminology, I spoke to him, and in the Greek it could go either way. It could be I challenged you or it could be I asked you. It's not real clear. But I believe that's what took place here. That he, he came to the disciples and said, here's my son. In other words, you know, all this stuff and who you are and who he is is true. Here you go. Fix this. And see, this is a key to understand because, and I think we see here and later on through the father's response that this was what was going on. So Jesus begins to have an interview with his father. I learned over the years when someone's struggling to get delivered and set free and healed, it's good to start asking questions. Let's get to the problem. Jesus says this in verse 19, he says, he answered and said, oh, faithless generation, 
how long shall I be with you and how long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Now, for years, it's been taught that the disciples didn't have faith. Eh, possibly. There's two accounts of this story, and both accounts kind of emphasize something differently. But I believe that the main subject that was not having faith here was the Father. Why is that? Why is this important to understand? I asked you, said this to start off with is, spiritual entities always have one question, who has the authority? See, this son is either not of age or not of his right mind, either one. So the one who is in authority here over the son is who? Anybody want to take a shot at it? It's the father. It's the father who's in authority. Then they brought him to him, talking about the demon-possessed boy. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and he wallowed, foaming at the mouth. In other words, he's in demonic fits now. This is full manifestation. And Jesus jumps right in the middle of it, and he begins to go into emergency tongue. Oh, no, that's not what it says. <laughs> that's not in there at all, is it? Because that's what most of us would do. One time we had a group with us, 20 people in India, and we had this big vehicle, and we were leaving. And it was just a crazy trip. It seemed like we got attacked from every place. And somebody threw a rock and hit the, the window and shattered the window. You heard 20 Christians all at once go into emergency tongues. Everybody was scared to death. I'm not blaming nobody. I'm just saying. And there's nothing wrong with sometimes when we don't know what to do to pray in tongues. Amen. If you don't have that, we can pray for you. Actually, Pastor Mike can pray for you. He's better at doing that than me. No, it's not what it says at all. Notice Jesus does not stop and deal with this demon. He doesn't deal with the boy. He has no attention. He puts no attention on the manifestation. Why would he not do that? Because the issue was not the boy and the issue was not the devil. Instead, he turns around and he says this, verse 12. Can you imagine this? This boy is foaming at the mouth. He is going crazy. I mean, right there, the disciples are probably thinking, Jesus, do something. And he does exactly what they don't think he's going to do. He turns his back on the circumstance and he turns around, and he looks directly at the father, ignores the devil, and he sa starts conducting an interview. It says this. So he asked the father, how long has it been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he throws them both into the fire, into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, this is called a heart change. I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out. Now it's, if you can do anything. Well, I believe the reason why all of a sudden is if you can do anything is because he's watching his son suffer again and his short memory now is reminded of much. He doesn't want his son to be like this. This ain't about a challenge. This is about, okay, I don't know if you are who you are. I don't know if your disciples are who they are. But at this point, you know what? If you can do something, go for it because we're tired of this. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him believes. Notice he didn't turn around and say, disciples, you need to believe. Who did he tell to believe? See, the disciples weren't novices. They'd already went out and healed the sick, cast out devils. They came back in John. They said, man, even the devils are subject. They were full of joy. It actually says when they came, Jesus sent them out two by two. And they said when they came back, they were filled with joy because of the miracles they had seen. And said, man, even the devil is subject to you in, in, in your name. And Jesus says, that's no big deal, man. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He's nobody. You should be glad because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Your name's in heaven. So these weren't novices. They'd already had miracle work in ministry. He doesn't go and correct them, not yet. He says, if you have faith, anything is possible. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Do you know what this tells me? For years, I thought in order to get God to move, I had to have great faith. Anybody else felt like that before? 
Matter of fact, for years, when I would minister to people and have healing lines, I would ask people three questions. One, do you believe God can heal you? If they were in the healing meeting, usually all of them said yes. Two, do you believe it's God's will to heal you right now? I lose about half of the people right there. I don't know. The third question is, I would say, do you believe, do you, believe you have enough faith to be healed today? And almost nobody would raise their hand. We made faith a giant. Faith is not Goliath, folks. We see this right here. Jesus said, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can speak into this mountain, be cast and be removed to the sea. Way too many people are trying to have faith in their faith. You need to have faith in Jesus. Are you with me? Put it like this. If you can't believe, then say it like this. Lord, I believe that you believe that by your stripes I'm healed. I'll put it right back on him and I'll just rest. Doesn't Paul say that when we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. He says, Lord, I believe, help my belief. So what does this tell me? Jesus doesn't stop and give him a 10 point message on having faith to have your son delivered. It doesn't exist here. He says, I can work with that. See, our faith has more to do with getting our will in line with God than feeling, having a feeling or a knowing or a thinking that we believe it's really going to happen right now. I was pre preaching a, a, a lead, our pastors and leaders conference in India. And in that conference, I was doing three services every morning, five days a week, teaching them how to work miracles and get results. Last service of the last day, I'm walking off the stage. I'm tired. One of the pastors has a massive heart attack. He falls over dead. I don't know what's going on. It's a pretty big meeting. There's about 1,200 pastors there. So they take me, they come and get me and, and go back there. And, and I just got done preaching on raising the dead, heal the sick. And now I got a dead man right in front of me. Let's be honest. That's not a fun position to be in. Now you're going, oh man, I got to not only preach it, I got to do it now. So I looked at the person who was putting this together that I was preaching for. And he says, he said, fix this. How many of you guys know when someone dies right in front of you and their bodies release their fluids? That'll slap you right upside the head. I don't care who you are. I said, fix it. Yeah. He said, raise him from the dead. You just preached it. I did, didn't I? So anyways, I laid hands on him. First thing I did was go into emergency tongues. I probably did. I, I, I rebuke death. I rebuke sickness. I command him to come back. I probably spent five minutes just praying over him. Do you know what happened? Nothing. I felt like I had no faith. But I was wise enough to doubt my doubts. Because God didn't need great faith. He just needed my will along with his will. Because if when I put my will with his will, now he has authority to move. Because he needs my authority to move. So I said that he, did, he doesn't come back. So I turned around and I looked at some of the pastors around us. And I said, where's the nearest hospital? I said, put them in the back of the truck. It was a king cab truck they had. I said, put them back there, load them up. And I said, drive them to the hospital. I said, before you get there, he's going to raise from the dead. I didn't believe one word I said. <laughs> I'm telling you, my, my mouth is speaking, my head saying, shut up. <laughs> they take off with him. The brother who was hosting this put together, he goes, praise God, he's going to come back. I know he is. I'm like, amen, he is. Inside, I'm going, oh, what did I just do? <laughs> just keeping it real with you guys this morning. 
So anyways, I'm saying, Lord, I said, I'm trusting you. I said, I don't feel like I am, but I'm making a decision. I've done everything I know to do. I've done my part. I put my will in line with yours. I know you don't want this man to die of this heart attack. See, God doesn't, he doesn't take people out by cancer and heart attacks. It's not the will of God. And I don't have time to get in that this morning. God intends for you to live a long, prosperous, good life that is a great testimony of his goodness. One day you shut your eyes and you don't wake up and you're with the Lord. That's the will of God. Sickness and disease. Jesus made it very clear. It said he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Sickness is oppression. Jesus heals sickness. Amen. He didn't call sickness good. He called it oppression. So about 15, 20 minutes down the road, we get a call. They're driving him down there. We get a call. They said, Brother Brian. He said, we're driving down the road, and all of a sudden, he starts coughing. He starts moving. His eyes get focused. They're like, he's alive. I'm like, really? <laughs> I, said, I said, what do we do? And I said, well, get him a change of clothes, because I remembered he had all over himself. I said, clean him up. And I said, take him to the hospital and just have him checked out. You know, he was back a few nights later with doctor documentation in hands because this man, this was his fourth major heart attack. That not only, obviously, did he come back from the dead, he had a brand new heart. 100% brand new, like a young man. It went from being 40-something percent dead to brand new, 100% alive, clear as a whistle heart. And I, didn't, I, I, and I want you to see this this morning. God didn't need this incredible great faith from me. He just needed me to stay in line with him and give him the authority to work. This is the reason why Jesus does not stop this man and say to him, wait, wait, wait. I, I, you, Lord, I believe. Help my un, unbelief. He doesn't go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, listen, listen, listen here, man. You, you're going to have to get rid of the unbelief first or I can't do this. No, he says, okay, I'll take, I believe. That's all I need. You know how merciful God is? He is a God of law and order. He's a God, he's not a God of chaos, but my goodness, he is so merciful in all those things. He's always looking for the smallest loophole to get in and do something. And he'll find it if you'll let him. Are you with me? There's so much pressure on people all the time. But we got to take the release off this thing. Let the pressure out. Rest. Faith is resting. It is not striving. I didn't even get near these notes. I was going to preach this one. I'm sorry. Let's keep reading here. You guys with me? You gone home. I said that one time when some lady in the back yelled, gone home. Apparently, she didn't like what I preached. If you do something like that to me, the only thing I know to do is laugh. All right. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible in belief. And immediately the father the child cried out with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw the people come running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, deaf and dumb spirits, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead. So many said, he is dead. <laughs> There's always those people, aren't they? But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And we had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. I want to just give you this idea about something here. First of all, let's be very clear. Jesus operated in a time before Satan was defeated. Colossians now says that he is completely defeated. He made a public spectacle over him. We are living in the new covenant now when Jesus resurrected that we are now dealing with a defeated foe that Jesus was not dealing with. He was actually dealing with somebody that did have authority in the earth. He took it back from them. So it should be easier to get results now than what it was even when Jesus was doing it. 
But when he says this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting, what I believe Jesus was revealing there to us is this. It didn't take prayer and fasting to have great power over this devil, especially now in the new covenant. Because that a lot of people taught that over years. Well, there's certain devils that you just got to pray and fast and you got to work hard. And, and, and I know people have taught that, but just because it's taught something we accept it doesn't make it true. Is the devil defeated or not? I'll tell you a story real quick. You guys know who Lester Summerall is? So Lester Summerall had this brother-in-law named Murphy. And when, in the end of Lester Summerall's life, he would still go out and do house calls. Literally people that were demon possessed. And so he's based in Indiana at the time. And there was this woman there and she was demon possessed. And she was, nobody could get her, get her delivered. People from, from his ministry would go. Nobody could do it. And word gets back to Lester Summerall. And he says, oh, that's it. We'll go do it. So he looks over to his brother-in-law, who was his best friend, Murphy, and he says, uh, hey, hey, Murphy, he says, I want you to pray and fast tonight, and I want you to pray and fast tomorrow, and I'm going to pray and fast tonight, and you're going to go pray and fast, and I'm going to pray and fast tomorrow, and you come over in the morning and pick me up, and we'll get this devil out of this woman. Murphy says, okay. So sure enough, they go over. He comes and pick, Murphy comes and picks up Lester Summerall. They drive to the home. They walk in the door, and this woman begins to manifest right off the bat. I mean, she's like, she looks like a cat. She's jumping from furniture from one side to the other. And Lester Summerall says, Devil, I prayed and fast last night. I prayed and fast this morning. Murphy prayed and fast last night. He prayed and fast this morning. The devil speaks up and says, Murphy didn't. I heard this from somebody who heard it directly from Lester Summerall. He says, what do you mean? He says, Murphy had eggs and ham. He looked over at Murphy. He goes, Murphy, did you eat this one? He says, I did. I was so hungry. Lester Summerall says, well, I don't care. You're coming out anyways. He cast it out. That has nothing to do with anything. I just think it's a funny story. My point is, is this. I believe the prayer and fasting has more to do with learning to get in tune with the Holy Ghost. Amen. See, my mentor taught me this years ago. When something's not at work, if something is not working, talking about ministering to the sick or walking by faith or whatever it might be, don't ask God why. Because that's what we do. God, why is it working? We all get whiny and stuff, you know. Ah, I believe you. I've been tithing. I've been giving. I've been laying hands on the sick. I've laid hands on myself. Why, 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 why? No, the, the, the right question is, God, what? What do I do? I think our time of prayer and fasting and spending time with the Lord just helps us get sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Amen. I think it was the fact that Jesus was led by the Spirit on how to handle a situation that the disciples were clueless about. Are you with me? I saw this with Pastor Mike. I was going to get to Matthew chapter 16 and talk about we've been given the, kingdoms, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, but I'm not going to get there this morning. And whatever we loose on earth, we loose in heaven. Whatever we bind on earth, we bound in heaven. But I was there with, with Pastor Mike. We were in India. The, when he came to India with me, I don't even know if he remembers this. And uh, we walked in to, this, to the home we were staying at before we went to our crusade place. And there was about 40 pastors in this room, and they were having a prayer meeting. They were praying for the crusade. Do you remember this, Pastor Mike? Okay. We walk in, and they're all in there, and they're praying. I mean, you walk in, you just walk right into the glory of God. And so I'm sitting, we walk into that, and, and I see that one, of, I think it was a, one of the pastor's wives was crippled. She couldn't walk. So I said, man, the presence of God stirred up like this. Let's pray for her. So I go over, I lay hands on her, and I command strength to come to her legs, and she begins to walk. So then there was another person there that was, uh, were they blind or deaf? Do you remember this? Blind. That's right. They were blind. And so I come over and I'm all excited. I'm like, man, let's pray for this blind eyes. And we pray for the blind eyes. And, and, I, and I'm, I mean, I am cursing her blind eyes. I can't get her healed for nothing. Nothing's changed. Mike walks up there, says something to her, and her eyes come open like that. I'm like, that ain't fair. I'm like, what, what in the world was that? And he said, well, the Lord just told me what to do. Well, what's that? And he goes, well, Jesus said we have the keys of the kingdom. Whatever we loose on earth, we loose in heaven. Whatever we bind on earth, we bind in heaven. He goes, you were binding, but you weren't loosing. So I went and loosed. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Do you remember this? Yeah. 
He said, you were binding the, the, the blindness. So I just went, laid my hands there and said, Lord, I just thank you. I lose blessing of her eyes and they can see. And they came open. So I like to say I got 50% of that. But anyways. <laughs> but it's being spirit led. Because here's the thing. You, as a believer, have authority. And God is waiting for you to operate in it. He's not just going to do something. He needs a willing vessel. He needs a conduit to flow through. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God with the spirit of God in you. And he's wanting to get out. You don't need to have great faith. Listen, people say all the time that faith and fear, they uh, counterbalance each other or they, they, they make each it obsolete. I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe faith and fear have anything to do with each other. People say fear is the opposite of faith. No, 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 no. I don't believe that. And the reason I don't is because fear is an emotion. Faith is a spiritual reality. I know people like to say we don't have the spirit of fear. I get that. But that word spirit there is actually talking more of just a mindset. It's not talking about a spiritual. People say, well, they had the demon of fear. Well, a demon can create fear, but that's not what the scripture is saying there. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul had just went through a terrible situation where he got beaten and left for dead. And now he's on his way to the Corinthians. And he's on the road. And he says this. When I came to you, I came determined. Or he said, when I came to you, I came in much fear and trembling. And he said, I determined to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified so that your faith would not be in the, 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 the wisdom of man's words, but in the power of the Holy Ghost. Here's my point. Faith is not the absence of fear. Faith is still moving forward even when you're in fear. There's a lot of people that stop because they're waiting to get out of fear. Mm-mm. We got to understand this. Your faith has more to do with God's authority and you acting and moving forward and believing is what God can work with. It's when you stop and you quit acting, he gets stuck. Are you with me this morning? Is this helping anyone? Well, I had some good scriptures here for you, but it's already 12.08, so I can't share them. Should we vote on this? <laughs> Some of you are like, there's a football game coming up. I got food at home. Let's look at this real quick. I want you to see something real quick. Isaiah chapter 9, 6 and 7. Let's just pull this up. Isaiah, this is speaking of Jesus. For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty of God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government, say government, and peace, there will be no end. See, there'll be no end to his government. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, in order to establish it with judgment and justice from the time forward and even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. I want you to see something this morning. This is what I want to get into. Jesus didn't come to establish a church service. We've been talking about this. He came to establish a government. And that is the kingdom of God. And in that government, he said this in Matthew 16, 13, when Peter said, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Two things there. One, he is the only one to God. He is the Messiah. Messiah. Number two, he's the son of the living God. How many of you guys know that before Jesus came to the earth, there was no son of the living God? John chapter 1, 12 and 13 says that those who believe in him, he gave them the right to be born of God, born, born of God. Not born of will of flesh, but born of God. Say, I am a son of God. Jesus goes on in Matthew 16, and this is what he says. This is Peter, blessed are you, for my father has revealed this to you. And on this rock, everybody say rock, on this foundation, on this revelation of man being God's very own son, I am going to build my church. The word church there in the Greek is the word ecclesia, God's governing body. That Jesus said, Isaiah said he came to establish what? His government. And we are his what? Governing 
body, the church, to operate in what? Authority to get his will accomplished in the earth. Jesus went on and said this. He says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Say kingdom of heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, it will be loosed in heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. God wants to get his will done through us. Amen. Stop asking God to do things. People say, ooh, I could never heal the sick, but Jesus can. Jesus is sitting in heaven. He's waiting on you by the spirit of God through you to go heal the sick. Amen. Are you with me? Quit putting it off on God. Go be bold. You're going to mess up. Who cares? First time I tried to pray for somebody, I told this story yesterday. The first time I ever stepped out to pray for someone, I'm 18, 19, 18 years old. I'm arguing with my friend. We're both in Bible college. We've got a head full of pride thinking we know everything and neither one of us know anything. Person walks into the Chinese restaurant. They're on crutches. Elderly man and my friend goes, he was saying, you can't just go and just pray for anyone. You know, you got to be led here and led there and led this and led everywhere or whatever. And I believe in being led. We just talked about it. But I also believe in just declaring, decreeing. Let me tell you something. God can lead a person who's on the move a lot better than you can just waiting. God, what do I do? Some Christians are like trying to move a car that you won't even start. You just back and forth. It doesn't go anywhere. He leads those who are already moving. And so this person walks in, my friend says, go pray for them, get them healed. I said, I will. He goes, go do it now. And I'm like, well, let them eat first. I'm trying to give myself some time. I had this theme most of my life being young. I had a big mouth and took my time. I'd always eventually do it, but because I'd put myself on the corner and I had to. They're leaving. I run outside. Sir, God doesn't want you on those crutches. He looks at his little wife. They're probably 70s, upper 70s. Looks at his little wife. What do you think? She sounds good. He goes, okay. He'd been very well trained by his wife. I said, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to show you that the God of the universe loves you. And I mean, I'm just going off, you know. He sits down in the car seat. And I'm going to pray for his legs. First time I ever did it. I can't wait, man. I'm going to show my friend I'm right. That's a bad motive, you know, real bad. Agenda was way off. Zeal, but stupidity all at the same time. This is not compassion. You follow me? This is arrogance. So anyways, I, I walk over there and I'm we'll get him healed. And I'm looking over my shoulder, my friend who's standing back by the doors of the restaurant. He goes, hold on. He takes his pants leg up and he pulls his leg off. <sighs> This is my first bold move of faith. The man has no leg. I'm not making this story up. This really happened. I'm looking over my friend and they're going, they're laughing at me. I did everything I could. I'd love to tell you his leg grew back, but if it did, it didn't do it that day. The point is, is and I didn't tell this in the first service last night when it happened, but I get in the car and I'm driving home. The Holy Spirit began to speak to me. He said, Brian. I said, yes, Lord. Very clearly, he's speaking to my heart. He said, next time make it about him and not about you. I said, oh yeah. Faith works by love. But you know what I learned from that? Because God teaches us something in everything, right? I went, you know, it didn't work and my motive was wrong, but it sure as the world didn't hurt me for trying. And I was able to be bold with a different motive moving forward. And we've seen thousands of amazing miracles, not just in the crusades, not just in church meetings, not just overseas, but in the streets. Why? Because I made the decision, as you can too, God lives in me. I'm a son of the living God. He's given me authority. Now let's go have some fun. Has this helped anyone this morning?
Praise the Lord. Stand your feet. Remember the story of the satyrian? Jesus came to him and he said, my servant is sick. And um, Jesus said, I'm going to come heal him. He says, I'm not even worthy for you to come to my house. And he makes a really important statement there that we got to see here. The satyrian does not say that I am a man with authority. That never, he doesn't say I'm a man with authority and I say to this one goes and he goes and this one comes and he comes and to this one do this and he does it. He says to Jesus, I am a man under authority. And I say to this one goes, he goes and this one comes and he comes and this one do this and he does it. And Jesus said, I have not seen greater, all greater faith in all of Israel. This man was not a Jew. And he says, go and your servant will be healed as you've asked. See, I want you to see something here. Everything we do in this earth, the reason why we get miraculous results, the reason why we can believe God for all kinds of things is because of the authority that we're under. We have been, been commissioned, say commissioned, by God himself to take this gospel to the world. We've been called co-laborers with Christ. Paul has said that we are ambassadors. What are we ambassadors? What are we commissioned with? We are commissioned by the government that Jesus came to establish that sits on his shoulders. You know, the ambassador of the United States, whatever country that he may be in, if he does something in that country that he's there, that country treats him like he's the president himself. And he says, we're ambassadors. That's the reason why we operate in authority. But we have to see it takes us to take a step of faith and exercise authority. Ephesians tells us that we've been given everything, every blessing, every promise, every position of possession of heaven. It's all ours. Paul tells us that we're seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. See, I'm seated with Christ. You know, the right hand represents authority. We are the authority of the Father in earth. I want you to do something different today. I wasn't, I was going to lay hands on everyone, but I want you to just stick your hands on you wherever you're suffering, wherever you might be. You know, there's one thing, place you have authority at right now is in your own body. Your body doesn't have the right to tell you what it does. Your body's your servant. Are you with me? It's your servant, not the other way around. You have the right to tell your body what to do and to come into line. Father, in Jesus' name, right now, Lord, we just thank you and we bless you, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. And Father, we thank you that this morning that you're here by your spirit. That not only did you promise where at least two or three gathered, you'd be in the midst of us. But Father, we thank you that every believer that walked in here this morning, that you live on the inside of us. And Father, right now, we thank you for the stirring of your anointing that abides in every one of us that's upon us. And we thank you, Father, that you're here to stretch forth your hand to heal the sick. Father, right now, I come into agreement with every person here. I come into agreement. I join my faith and my authority with theirs. And right now, Father, I thank you that healing is beginning to take over, sweep this building right now. I thank you for your presence, that you're touching people. Father, right now we speak to tumors and cancers and we command them to die and, and, and to go. Father, we speak to eyes and we command them to see in Jesus' name. Father, we speak to ears and we command them to hear clearly. Father, we speak right now to skin conditions, and we command them to be making whole. Right now, in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you that arthritis is dying, inflammation is going, bones are being renewed, joints are being restored, ligaments are being healed. 
Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus that organs are coming to life, kidneys fully functioning, lungs fully functioning, Father. Lord, we thank you for heart disease being whole and healed, hearts being restored, arteries being cleared, Father, in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you that high blood pressure is coming down. Father, we thank you that the effects of strokes and accidents are being healed right now in this room in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you right now that creative miracles are taking place and things that have been destroyed through accidents are being restored right now in Jesus' name. We speak to diabetes and we curse you and we command the pancreas to begin to work and to function the way that it's supposed to. Father, we thank you for blood disease being whole and healed right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you right now. Right now, Father, for minds being restored. Fear and anxiety leaving. Mental uh, torment leaving in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you right now that you're healing and restoring every single person that's coming to you, Father. Lord, we thank you that you don't ask us to have great faith, but to exercise our will and authority and to come in alignment with you. And right now, we thank you that that's taking place in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that anything that I didn't mention, Lord, that you're healing and touching. In the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that the fear of death in some people's hearts is being removed, even those that are watching online this morning. In Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, for complications of COVID-19, lingering things being restored and healed in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Joints coming loose. Just lift your hands right now and begin to thank them. Father, we thank you right now. We thank you right now for what you're doing. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Now, if you can, I want you to test yourself out. And what do I mean that? Go and check. Begin to feel where the tumor's at if you had one. Close the good eye and begin to see out the bad eye. Close to plug the good ear. Whatever you couldn't do, move a joint, bend over. I don't care what it is. Just test yourself out. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Test yourself out. How many of you right now can tell God's doing something in your body? Just wave your hand at me right there. One. Wave it at me and keep it up there. I got to see the lights. Look at all these hands coming up right now. One, two, three, four, five. Who else? Six. You can tell. Seven. Who wants to share a testimony real quick? Anybody want to share this? Pastor Mike, do we have time? Where are you at? Oh, you're right there. Am I okay or am I going way over? All right. Good. That means we got another hour. Just joking. <laughs> He has authority in this church, not me. That's a joke. All right. Who wants to testify real quick? Who would testify what God's doing? Come on up here. Don't get scared. Don't get nervous in the service. You want to testify? All right. There you go. I'm looking at you. I put pressure on you, didn't I? All right. Um, I've just had a lot of uh, pain in my neck um, with arthritis. And I think a lot of it was probably stress too at work. And I was putting my... Uh, hand on my neck and it just it's loose I don't feel any pain yeah. at all how often is it like that um, it's like that almost all the time how many how long um, it's been for like last month or two praise the Lord hallelujah God's good at me oh good good report tomorrow then amen who else had their hand raised all right who wants to you all get nervous all right I knew you were gonna say something I had polymyalgia rheumatica most people can't even say it. Yeah. One other person in this church has it too. It's many muscles in pain. Uh -huh. And I feel fine. And did you come here today in pain? Yes, I did. When did, it, when did it go away? When you stepped down. Praise the Lord. God's good. Amen. 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 So, so I, I believe God and lived seven years with an autoimmune disease that was very similar to hers that God healed me from. And, and I know what that feels like. To get delivered from that is, it's, it's awesome. So let's just thank God for that. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Who else is willing? One more testimony. Anybody else? You, there was a bunch of you that raised your hand that you could tell you're being touched and healed. But who? Where's that at? Oh, right. Where? Now you both got to share. Wholeheartedly, and I was very young when I started with this, but I've done many, many.
God has given me many miracles. And I just asked him. And I'm supposed to write a book. Everybody tells me, write your book, write your book. Yeah. Well, what are you waiting on? Do it. Huh? I've been a caregiver for the last 20 years, cause, so I haven't had time. In fact, I'm thinking I'm going to go back. Yeah. Well, God will give you to. What's, were you healed? Who else raised their hand? The people raised their hand. Who else? Okay, there you are. Sorry. One more testimony. Uh, we just started coming here a little while ago, and we love the worship. We love how you guys just praise God. And this brother here, Sharon, about being healed, you don't have to have great faith. And I've always believed that. And, you know, I've had, I've worked construction for 30 years and did a lot of carpentry work, so my back's kind of mang mangled up. But um, today, as I prayed, I was in pain. I'm in pain all the time. And you brought this message. It just, the pain went away. God. Hallelujah. Amen. God's good. Amen. All right. Well, God's good. Every eye closed, every head bowed, no one looking around. I'm going to do this real quick. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, what do I mean by that? You've not accepted him as Lord and Savior. The Bible says, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. What does that mean? That Jesus, 2,000 years ago, born without a virgin, born by the virgin without sin, went to the cross, sinless, he died on the cross, not just for you, but as you. He took on your sin. He took on the judgment and wrath of God on the cross. He took on the penalty. He died on that cross and he raised again on the third day so that you would not just be forgiven, but that you could receive what he deserved, righteousness and justification. The Bible says, if you believe that and confess Jesus, that when you do, the spirit of God will come and live inside your eternal spirit and you become a child of God. That's it. Not asking you to do anything else. There's no other conditions to be born again. If you're here today, every eye close, every head bowed, this is between you and God. If you're here today on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. You say, I want to accept Jesus. One, two, three. Raise it now. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. We're gonna all do this together. Everyone look up at me, put your hand on your heart. We're gonna pray together. If you raise your hand, that you pray this with us. If you didn't raise your hand, but you wanted to, you can still pray this with us. But let Pastor Mike and Chris know you made a decision this morning to receive Jesus. All of us together. Oh God, I believe that Jesus is your son. He died on the cross. He shed his blood so that my sins would be forgiven. He raised from the dead so that I'd be justified once and for all. Thank you, Jesus, for making me a child, for saving me making me righteous before you. I declare that as I serve you, all of Satan's bondage will be broken in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that today, let somebody know you did. There was a few hands that went up, and that's awesome, you guys. So listen, uh, be seated real quick. We're going to do one more thing. And, and if you want to be kept updated with our ministry, where we're going, uh, we just did a crusade in Pakistan. We're going to show a video real quick. It's two minutes. And, and then uh, we're going to Tanzania to do a crusade, the Dominican Republic, back to Pakistan. Uh, we just saw over 70,000 Muslims receive Jesus in this last crusade. That's pretty cool. Amen. Great miracles, people walking uh, who couldn't walk. You, know, you guys know this. Pastor Mike, you know, I, 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 it's such an honor that he always gives me credit. Like, I helped him out, and I guess I did. But the truth of the matter was, is it was pretty easy to help somebody out who was pursuing it. Amen. And so I just got to be a part of that. But uh, if you want to be kept updated, do it, raise your hand, and we'll get some cards to you to fill out. Just do me a favor. Don't write in tongues. I don't want to have to interpret it, or our office doesn't. You know, but if you got your hand up, who's going to help me out there? Go ahead, brother, help me out. Dan, if you, if you got your hand raised, uh, and, and we may have run out of cards, or we may run out of cards. And if, you, if we don't have enough and you want to fill it out, I'm sure Pastor Michael will let you grab one of the Connect cards from them and fill it out there. Just make sure you put Brian S. Reed Ministries on it so he knows to give that to us. So anybody else here? All right. All right. If you don't want to know what God's doing on in our ministry, we'll forgive you. Praise the Lord. God's good. All right. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to do a video real quick. Pastor Mike, you'll come up and take up the offering at the end, right? It's all ready. Okay. Well, we're going to do a video at the end. I'll let him close it, but you guys want to go ahead and show the video. This was the crusade we just did in September. It's the first crusade I've done by Zoom. Long story why we had to do it, but it worked.
Jesus said, somebody touched me. So 2,000 years ago, God sent an angel to the Virgin Mary. First, they whipped him with a whip. Me. Tonight he is on the field by his spirit. If you see me, you sing the book. He's against murderers in peace. I'm gonna break the fierce in body. Yeah. I want you to lay your hands on whatever area. I speak to deaf and dumb spirits, and I command you to loose their talk. We command strength to come into the legs of the crippled. Father, we thank you right now. I Pastor Brian, many have been healed and many have accepted the Lord, so we rejoice. I am brother Uh, well, so we're going to dismiss here in a moment. Uh, again, yeah, if you'd like to uh, sow into Brian's next crusade, his ministry, uh, just indicate uh, on your offering, you know, whatever, uh, whatever amount that is for him. And then also our regular house offering. Uh, we'll, um, it'll just all go in that back box, and then we'll, uh, we'll put a, uh, a special check for him, and we'll also give in from the house. And, uh, and I'll figure that out, and it'll be all fine. That's a, it works. We don't pass a basket anymore. We haven't done that for a year and a half. It works just fine. <laughs> We're not going back to it. So God bless you all. I love you. I actually, say a prayer for me, too. I'm doing a, I am doing a crusade uh, Tuesday morning, uh, so also in Pakistan. Yeah, so it'll be a little smaller than that one, but it, uh, <laughs> so it'll be good. I'll share pictures with you next week. So God bless you. Have an amazing day. I love you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for coming. Thank you.